sao nó
Hello, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ma. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our webinar this evening on enhancing surgical safety in the operating room. My name is Adenike Ajibodu, and I'm thrilled to be your to one of to be one of the moderators for today's discussion. Surgical safety is a critical aspect of healthcare that directly impacts patient outcome and quality of care. Today, we have gathered here to delve into ways to improve and enhance safety practices in the operating room, ensuring the highest standard of care for our patients. Throughout this webinar, we will have the opportunity to explore the best practices, share insights, and engage in meaningful discussion on how we can collectively work to go together towards a safer surgical environment. And I know we are going to enjoy this evening. So let us use this platform to learn from each other and exchange ideas. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. So let's start this webinar. Hello. Hello. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name good is evening. Blessing. My name is Blessing Ubu, and I would like to read a short biography for the speaker. Dear esteemed members of talk, we are delighted to announce Bruna Tezira, RN, SPN, BDAN, BSN, PhD student, researcher, AORN Global Relations Committee member as a distinguished speaker for this webinar on enhancing surgical safety in the operating room. Bruno brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the table. He is currently pursuing his PhD in clinical and health services research, focusing on the critical topic of prevention of unintentional detection of surgical items. With over 25 years of dedicated service as a preoperative nurse at Hospital Pedro Hispano Matisnos, Bruno's practical insights are invaluable. As a specialist in preoperative nursing, SPN, and with a postgraduate diploma in anesthesia nursing, PDN, Bruno possesses deep knowledge of critical aspects of surgical safety. He has been actively involved in academia, serving as an invited assistant at CESPU Nursing School and Pijat Institute Nursing School, while also contributing significantly to research endeavors, including the dis dis translation and validation of the Portuguese ICNPIO. Bruno's committee safety is further evident through his involvement in various policy improvement projects, particularly focusing on evidence-based intraoperative care to prevent surgical items retention. As a member of AORN since 2021, Bruno has played pivotal roles, including serving on the Global Relations Committee for the 2023-2024 term and being recently invited to assume the role of president-elect for the 2024 to 2025 term. He's also the president of AOR Portugal chapter and president-elect of Portuguese Preoperative, showcasing his leadership within the field. Through his extensive network and collaborations with the Preoperative Nursing Community globally, Bruna actively promotes best practices and fosters partnerships to elevate standard of care. We are honored to have Bruno Tezira share his insights and expertise with us during talk webinar as we collectively strive to advance surgical safety and improve patient outcomes in the operating room. Please join us in welcoming Bruna to share his invaluable insight with us. You are welcome, sir.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, let's try to <clears throat> share my page for you with my, my laptop. I will be okay. Everyone can hear me very well. Yes, we can. Yeah, so, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Sorry, I'm trying to stop just to share it off the screen with you. Um, I think this is the video. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit trouble with the sharing. Hello, no, this is uh... okay. I think it's okay now. Every everyone is watching now the the presentation. It's okay. Yes, I can hear you. I'm solid. Uh, let me just see if everyone is seeing the, the presentation, please. Can yes, I, we can. You want to answer me? Okay, okay, let's start. I'm sorry thank for you. this delay. Um, thank you. I uh, have a little bit trouble here with the internet and also with uh, trying to connect everything. So, uh, starting now, good morning, afternoon, and evening for everyone. I don't know where you are, but you're very welcome to be here. It's very uh, pleaseful for me. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I am personally grateful to the Operating Room Global TORG team, and especially to Adam Solo Okoli for extending this invitation to me to speak at this STEAM gathering webinar. It's an honor to be here representing Portugal amongst such distinguished uh, professionals and members of the community. I'm sorry for my English. I hope you can understand. If you don't understand anything that I'm saying, please. Um, don't don't uh, be don't have any problem. Just to ask me, I can stop and try to uh, talk again. What you are uh, are able to understand. So as I was saying, we are here all united by our commitment to enhancing surgical safety. Today I will try to embark us 
uh, on a journey through the landscape, landscape of surgical safety, exploring its critical aspects and how we can collectively contribute to safer surgical environments. So let's delve into the insights and findings that can guide us in this vital mission. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to make a faculty disclosure. I want to clearly state that I have nothing to declare in terms of conflict, conflict of interest, financial or otherwise, related to this presentation. My objective today is to share knowledge and insights that are based solely on the best available evidence and my professional experience in enhancing surgical safety. So, uh, my name is Bruno Teixeira. Uh, I won't be uh, here uh, too long because uh, I, I just have to say uh, thank you for your presentation. You're a uh, great presenter with for all my bio. I don't want, I don't want to bother you at all uh, talking about this anymore. So uh, today I'm here to talk a little bit about enhancing surgical safety in the operating room, and I'll try to explore several critical areas. First, uh, we'll delve into the WHO surgical safety checklist, examining its impact on surgical practice worldwide. Next, we will address surgical challenges, identifying common obstacles and strategies to overcome them. Our discussion will then pivot to my research where I'll share insights from my work, emphasizing its implications for surgical safety. Finally, we'll focus on patient safety outcome focus, highlighting the importance of outcome-based approaches in enhancing patient care. Our goal and my goal for us for this discussion is to foster a comprehensive understanding of these areas, driving forward the conversation on surgical safety. So one of my goals is to create a little bit of discussion in here. So of course, when we talk about enhancing surgical safety in the operating room, everyone is aware about whose global initiative on surgical safety. And the objectives of the Global Initiative on Surgical Safety are to implement a reduction of surgical morbidity and mortality, to implement also the whole surgical safety checklist, enhancing surgical workforce training, and also improving surgical infrastructure and equipment. When we talk about reduction of surgical morbidity and mortality, the WHO aims to reduce the rates of surgical complications and deaths globally, setting specific targets for improvement. Also, when we try to implement WHO surgical safety checklist, the WHO advocates for the universal adoption of the surgical safety checklist, demonstrating its effectiveness in reducing surgical errors and enhancing patient outcomes. Of course, when we, we are talking about enhancing surgical workforce training, we are emphasizing the need for improved training and education for the surgical workforce to ensure the highest standards of patient care. And about improving surgical infrastructure and equipment, we are focusing on accessibility, availability, and quality of surgical infrastructure and equipment, especially in low and middle income countries. And now a little bit about the surgical safety checklist and its impact. I brought to this slide for, for uh, this presentation uh, the latest meta-analysis. It's a systematic review with meta-analysis about uh, the impact of the surgical safety checklist. And when we are uh, talking about this study, we will see that the findings of this meta-analysis included 20 systematic reviews for a quality systematic analysis. And from these reviews, 24 unique observational cohort studies were identified, reporting pre-post data on 18 clinical outcomes. 
the findings show that the implementation of the WHO surgical checklist is associated with improvements in several clinical outcomes, including reductions or that mortality, sorry, uh, in morbidity, surgical side infections, pneumonia, and planned returns to the open, urinary tract infections, blood loss requiring transfusion, and planned intubation and sepsis. The deep, the deep vein thrombosis was the only post-operative outcome assessed that did not show improvement with the use of the WHO surgical safety check. This analysis highlights the WHO surgical check, uh, safety checklist, sorry, effectiveness in enhancing various clinical outcomes underlying its role in improving patient safety and surgical care quality. Additionally, the review indicates that the WHO surgical safety checklist positively affects process measure, team dynamics, and communication, as well as safety culture in the OR. However, the review also notes variability in the impact and outcome, suggesting that the success of the WHO surgical safety checklist is influenced by multiple factors, including the specific content of the checklist, how it's implemented, its integration into existing workflows, and the training and engagement of staff using it. The World Health Organization's surgical safety checklist plays a pivotal role in enhancing surgical processes and team dynamics. By ensuring that every team member is aware and adheres to each step of the checklist, the SSC fosters a culture of communication, coordination, significantly reducing the likelihood of errors. It prompts team members to confirm critical details collectively, enhancing the shared understanding and the accountability that are vital for patient safety. The standardization is not just about following procedures, it's about instilling a safety first mindset across the team, leading to a stronger, more cohesive approach to patient care in the operating group. The result is a more informed, alert, and communicative team environment, which is crucial for maintaining high safety standards and improving patient outcomes. However, the variability in the effectiveness of the SSC across different settings, one of them, there are some factors affecting the surgical safety check success, like uh, implementation, training, and engagement. The impact of the whole surgical safety checklist can vary. Uh, sorry, varies depending on several context specific factors. It's crucial to adapt SSC to the local context, considering the unique aspects of each healthcare setting, including the cultural nuances, resource availability, and the existing workforce. The success of the SSC inches on factors like leadership support, team engagement, and thorough training. To enhance its effectiveness, areas for further research may include exploring how adaptations of the checklist affect compliance and patient outcomes, as well as also investigate strategies to overcome barriers to its implementation. Understanding these dynamics can lead to more effective customization of the checklist, ensuring it supports rather than hinders the surgical process, thereby improving safety culture and patient care. We need more attention to this, and so we need to do more research about it. When we talk about surgical safety, of course, we need to talk about the ethical responsibility, the professional responsibility, and the scientific responsibility that as healthcare professionals have. So, about ethical responsibility, it upholds the highest ethical standards in surgical care, ensuring patient safety and informed consent are paramount. 
when we talk about the professional responsibility, we are talking about adhering to strictly to the professional guidelines and standards to maintain and enhance the quality of surgical care. And about the scientific responsibility, never <clears throat> we are also sorry, we are also talking about implementing evidence-based practice and continually continuously updating protocols based on the latest scientific research to improve patient outcomes. Of course, the role of the stakeholders from up to down healthcare systems like who GCI and for instance ARN safe health policy are very important. So collectively there is a responsibility in surgical safety since the top to ourselves in practice. Adopting evidence-based practice in surgical safety is paramount, ensuring that every procedure is guided by the most current and robust research. To enhance access to such vital inform information, healthcare institutions can leverage digital libraries, subscribe to medical journals, and encourage participation in professional forums and conferences, webinars like this. Furthermore, establishing a network among healthcare professionals allow for the exchange of insight, experiences, and innovative practices, fostering a collaborative environment where knowledge is shared and applied, ultimately driving the advancement of surgical safety and uh, standards and patient care outcomes. Uh, here we are uh, after uh, the pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic, and we are doing just what I've said. We are utilizing the internet, we are utilizing platforms, and we are sharing knowledge. And this is very important for us to level up and be more aware of every evidence-based practice that we can share together. Of course, when we talk about surgical safety, we also need to talk about the Sentinel events. So I brought here the Joint Commission um, Sentinel event data annual review for 2022. And in here, we can see that we have um, on the graphic on bottom below on the right corner, we can see that there was a big uh, increase during the last years uh, from 2018 to 2022. And this surgical, um, this Sentinel event, sorry, uh, were uh, increasing uh, mainly connected to the pandemic that we were, uh, uh, that was occurring with us. So uh, this is one of the main factors. But when we talk about surgical safety, we should look not only for this table, but also to these two graphics. And on the table, we have that there are, the, the fall are on the top. The delay in treatment is the second, no, the second post. Uh, and then we have unintentional retains uh, of foreign object. That's the, the third. Uh, these are the events, uh, Sentinel events from 2022 report. But as also we can see on the left corner, uh, uh, we have a uh, wrong surgery site and also the graphic between 2018 and 2022 uh, for uh, unintentionally retained surgical items. And we can see there are, uh, they are decreasing. So it, we can see uh, when we look at this graphic, that uh, besides we are being, uh, passing through a pandemic, through COVID-19 pandemic, we were improving the, our surgical safety. And it's good. Let's talk about 
a little bit now about my research on URSI prevention. So, my research identifies and then analyzes discrepancies in surgical procedures that contribute to URSI incidents aiming to standardize practice. One of the things that I'm doing is data analysis now through meticulous data collection and uh, analysis and try to uncover patterns and risk factors associated with retained surgical items in farming preventive strategies. One of my aims is about technology integration. I explore the integration of advanced technologies and tracking systems in surgical settings to reduce URSI occurrences, enhancing overall surgical safety. I brought here uh, OCD data for URSI just to show you one of the main problems that we are uh, getting uh, since I started this research. When we are looking to the UK data or to the US data, mainly we can see that the, there are uh, data that is very uh, connected to practice. But when we look no, at no, no, sorry. Um, or, hello? Yes? Yeah, I think the screen is zoomed out. If you can just zoom it in, um, that might help a little, if you don't mind, please, thanks. I mean, it's zoomed, okay, no. you can zoom in. No, it's it's big now. I mean, we need it to shrink in size more. I shrink more. This way? More, yes. Okay, now? Yeah. No, a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I think it's still zoomed out, but we can keep going anyway. Thank you so much. Yeah, much better now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. No, Thanks. It's it's okay now. Let's see how it is now. It, it's better now. We can keep going. Okay. And, no, okay. I think it's zoomed out again. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to. And now it's okay. Yes, it's better now. Okay. Uh, so Thanks. I was saying that. Um, there are some countries uh, that report uh, estimates, like us here in Portugal. We don't have the correct data for uh, for reporting because uh, what's the issue here? We are under-reporting. So we know that under-reporting is an issue for every country, but here um, it's uh, we have the second victim problem, and we have to uh, talk about this, try to change positively. Uh, our practice and try to start doing more report. Mm -hmm. um, so as we see here, we see that the, uh, these are not the correct data. These are just estimates for 2015 until 2022. So in my research, I am focused on updating perioperative nursing practice to enhance surgical safety, specifically targeting URSI profession with the goal of implementing and testing best practices nationwide to improve patient care here in Portugal. My research focuses on developing strategies to mitigate the risks and discrepancies in surgical procedures that lead to URSI leveraging technology for safer surgical out outcomes. Engagement strategy focuses on actively involving stakeholders in enhancing URSI prevention and perioperative nursing practice. I am the advancing perioperative nursing by integrating education, data access, and adherence to top guidelines in URSI prevention and other surgical safety topics. Leveraging research and practice, uh, sorry, practice data is crucial for shaping effective URSI prevention strategies, guiding daily planning, and defining tailored outcomes, preferably through patient report outcomes to ensure reliability and relevance. I will be probably in the next month preparing for uh, doing uh, first uh, cross-sectional study 
data from a cross sectional study and then prepare the implementation or observational or an experimental study to test and adapt URSI prevention strategies for local, for here for Portugal, to uh, try to see and test the practical, practical efficiency. When we are talking about local needs and global standards, it's very important to talk about training and updating local um, uh, is crucial for integrating the latest surgical safety standards and protocols, ensuring that staff well informed and procedures remain effective. Leadership governance, of course, plays a pivotal role in establishing a culture of safety, endorsing continuous education, and reinforcing the importance of adhering to updated practices. Moreover, networking and collaboration are vital research and practice improvement, enabling the sharing of insights, discoveries, and best practice across institutions and specialties, which can lead to innovative solutions and advancements in surgical safety. We are all uh, together here. This is a very uh, important share, uh, moments of shared knowledge. This is one of the ways we can do this to collaborate and do this networking. And what about key opportunities? The syn synergistic effect of combining safety focus opportunities like political advocacy, patient's awareness, and professional responsibility to enhance surgical practice. By integrating policies that reinforce safety protocols, healthcare systems can ensure consistency and effective practice across the board. Informed patients who are more engaged and advocate for their care contribute to a culture of safety and accountability also. Healthcare professionals are encouraged to embrace these develop developments, leveraging them to drive improvements in surgical safety, thus maintaining it as the central pillar of patient care. This approach not only fosters a proactive environment for safety enhancements, but also ensures that the collective efforts of policymakers, patients, and practitioners lead to substantial and lasting improvements in surgical outcomes. And so we should discuss the critical need of foreign going research to validate and update all aspects of safe surgical protocols. In our collective journey towards surgical excellence and improved patient outcomes, I urge each of us to embrace active engagement in our local environments. Let's commit to the continuous improvement of surgical safety practice, fostering an atmosphere where learning and enhancement are ongoing by creating and participating on collaborative efforts and networks. We can share their knowledge, strategies, and innovation. Furthermore, I encourage collaboration in research aimed at practice improvement, ensuring that our actions are informed by evidence and contribute to the broader body of knowledge in surgical safety. Together, through these actions, we can make a significant impact on patient care and outcomes. To enhance surgical safety, we focus on implementing the WHO Surgical Safety Checklist is vital for reducing errors and improving patient outcomes. We also emphasize surgical workforce training that is crucial for skill enhancement and adhere to best practice. We aim to enhance access to current research, ensuring that surgical teams are informed and practices are evidence-based. We shall strict adherence um, Professional, to professional guidelines that ensure consistent, high-quality surgical care. And it's very important also networking and collaboration among healthcare professionals and research foster a community of learning and improvement driving forward patient safety outcomes. Our commitment is to achieve excellence in surgical safety, making patient welfare our foremost priority. Um, 
I want to uh, now open the discussion. If you want to ask, I, I, I would like you to bring some um, doubts that you have, some uh, any practical issues that you have been uh, that you ever had with um, surgical safety or the who surgical sa safety share. Please uh, come along. I hope you can uh, make any question. I think Stella has uh, some question. Could you? Is raising a hand. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank Bruno. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm just curious. What are the monitoring systems that are in place for all the countries that are represented here um, on our webinar? As far as um, all of our other TORG members, is there a centralized repository, kind of like how the United States has Joint Commission that kind of you know keeps an eye on these numbers? Is there something similar? in Europe, in Africa, in all of your respective countries? Uh, I can answer uh, your question talking about uh, the Portuguese experience. So we have um, on our healthcare system, we have uh, the same responsibility to um, report and to gather those data and then uh, annually uh, bring them along and there's uh, this organization that I was addressing the those data before on that on that uh, table that is OCD OCD uh, that is all, always bringing the, uh, this data uh, regularly so uh, we can see it um, every year um, but the problem stayed before uh, not uh, about uh, getting the data and reporting, but inside the facility. So when we are talking about the practices, any problem that uh, we have, we need to report, we need to address it on a different way. Um, and then we will get those data and we can see and uh, try to do some research, change some aspects. About the other countries, I don't know at all. I hope that someone can help me of other countries. That's all I don't know if, or if you are uh, able to. Yeah, to um, thank us. you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bruno. That was a nice um, and highly insightful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing the relevant knowledge. I don't know if I got the question, I mean, that was raised. Can someone just repeat that? I mean, in terms of other countries, I don't know if, so I don't miss anything. I think I missed one point. Um, I was, Stella, I was just curious. Yes, I was just curious to see if, you know, in your respective countries, do you have a centralized reporting system to track safety issues? Because, you know, you need data to support you know, implementation of specific safety practices. And so I'm just wondering how good is the data collection in each of your respective countries? Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, um, I think I would have to throw that open to the house. Like if other people from other countries would like to answer that for us, especially low and middle income countries, um, do you have a centralized reporting system? Does anyone want to try that? Let's see so that we can have a range of opinions from, because I can speak for Ireland anyway. Um, well, I wouldn't say we have a centralized, um, we just have an incident reporting protocol in each hospital and um, that would be passed on to the risk and management, the risk management team within 48 hours. And usually as has been said in the presentation that the issue is on the reporting of these things. Like a lot of things go on and people actually don't either report it or it's underreported because number one, they are afraid of speaking up, um, especially 
um, in terms of blame game, you wouldn't want to be blamed for anything um, because things might actually, you might report something and things might turn around and you get to be blamed eventually. You wouldn't want that to happen. And um, there's under reporting as well because, well, I would say management issues um, because people need to be supported. You, If you want to report something, even if there is a centralized reporting system, you want to make sure that your management is backing you up. You understand what I mean? Especially um, either you're a perioperative nurse or um, I know medical professionals would always be supportive regardless. But on the nursing side, a lot of things might actually still need uh, to be reviewed so that things might be more appropriate. I think I might ask other countries, does anyone want to respond to that and see if there is a centralized reporting system in their respective countries? Someone from Ghana. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, my name is Rueda Khan. I'm from Peter Meritzburg, KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. And um, at MediClinic South Africa, we have a system whereby um, us as managers, together with clinical risks, do regular audits on our teams for um, on the surgical safety checklist. And that data is loaded onto our system and it's viewed by MediClinic Corporation. Um, uh, we have had, because of these regular audits on our team, the team is so active that we've had a couple never events which were reported and has been dealt with with the corporation. So we do have a system of reporting and we have in, an enormous support from the company. Thank you. That should be good, honestly. <laughs> That's a good one, I think. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for that, for sharing South African um, perspective with us. Thank you so much. I think, is there someone from Rwanda? Let's see. Do you have a centralized reporting system for never event safety issues? Let me see if there is anyone. Wilson, is there Wilson in the house? Okay, I think, um, <laughs> well, from my point of view, I would say there is there is to an extent in terms of the audits, even as uh, from South Africa, um, in Ireland, there is audits. And I would say from Niger in Nigeria, basically, um, under reporting would really be the issue, especially not just in Nigeria, African countries. Um, people want to be supported by their management. People want to be um people really want to speak up but a lot of things might need to be looked at in terms of policies um and as we mentioned evidence based practices need to be um implemented as well and audits some audits need to be introduced so that uh, everything can be captured and nothing is missing and even when things are being audited they should be followed up um you should not just go behind someone's um on that someone's table if you know what i mean I mean, it should be followed up and things, structures, quality improvement plans, QIPs should be put in place to make sure things don't happen again. And it should be really emphasized that, that this is not a blame game. We all want to learn yeah. from this and just make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so thank you so much, Mr. Bruno. I think if anyone else yeah, has any that's question that's or contribution. Yeah, thanks. I would, I would like to say just, um addressing the, the stellar question. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. And yeah. uh, when we are talking about um, uh, this problem in, in the countries that we are uh, under reporting, uh, we also see the surgical safety checklist as a very important uh, issue, a very important um, step with the task that we are doing. But we also see that we need to audit our practices and policies because we need to, to check if them are uh, really connected to the best evidence-based practice. And we should do this together. We should do this by a positive um, experience, not to try to see if uh, that facility is doing the, the incorrect way because sometimes people don't know what's the best practice. Um, we don't have in each country and each uh, hospital and each facility, the, the best guidelines. We need to uh, get those guidelines to those professionals 
we need we need to address this info these uh, guidelines to to those uh, colleagues and and before we uh, uh, be here so uh, sometimes so much connected to uh, see what's the best practice uh, through the research about the surgical safety checklist um, experience we should also not just be there connected to that checklist but also audit what's the practice that we have are we practicing the best the best evidence is there and if we do this probably we involve everyone everyone will feel more connected and more involved through uh, getting uh, the best outcomes and then the surgical safety checklist will be uh, there doing uh, what is uh, meant to be Anyone uh, wants to ask any question? Hey, Bruno. It's Gert. Oh, <laughs> hi, Gert. That's it. Hi. So great presentation. And along the lines of Estella's question, just kind of a comment and a thought you bringing up the need to identify these events in the various countries. And we keep talking about the world, the surgical safety checklist. If we think back to where that started, the World Health Organization with Atul Gawande, my thought is all of a sudden, shouldn't there be a global repository for all of this so that everybody can compile this data and really track the events. And again, like everybody said, not placing blame, but looking at the processes and figuring out what's going to work best with each area. Just something that popped into my mind. So great discussions. Uh, thank you, Bert, for your, for your question, for your comment. Um, uh, I totally agree. Uh, we are, uh, when we talk about uh, this, uh, issues related to surgical safety of checklist, we are, of course, talking about the global problem. And we know that in the countries that these practices are the best, they are also the best reports, the best data to, to, to do research and to understand the problems. But we are talking about uh, the best practice in the best countries with the, the best incomes, uh, but still, the problems are the same for the the less income countries. When you, when we talk about the barriers, the barriers are the same. So um, we can utilize uh, uh, those data to try to help and try to change some practice. But of course, I I, I totally agree that we need to do this discussion about creating uh, collectively uh, data to to understand the problem in a broader way. Thank you so much. I think there's a question in the chat box as well from Stella. So as you go about utilizing the most up-to-date guidelines and processes, where do you all go to to find the most updated resources? And I think it's about making the resources and guidelines available for all countries now. So how, how do we go about that? Mr. Bruno, can you advise us? and recommend, or if there is one we could adapt. I know AORN is, has a great reserve of all these guidelines constantly being reviewed. We want to make them accessible to low and middle income countries. So how do we actually go about that? Can you help? Yes. Um, I don't know if I can help, but I'll try to explain my perspective. So yes, um, when we talk about the, uh, about the best practices and the best guidelines, of course, we are talking on surgical safety and uh, about perioperative nursing. We need to talk about AORN, of course, because um, there are a lot of research doing. Uh, there is a lot of uh, arm processing research about surgical safety, about every issue that we do on our perioperative practice. But until today, there's none evidence better than the systematic reviews that ARN provides to all of us each year. So 
continuously to uh, 75 years of PRN. We have from 1976, the first, for instance, the first the guideline for this practice, the uh, unwritten surgical items uh, prevention, they started to do systematic reviews from them. And they are always, always improving and getting better data and screening every research, every cl clinical trial, every uh, event report, every study, every observational study. So they are screening everything and they provide us with the recommendation, the conditional recommendations. We can see what's the best practice that we can do in our settings. So connecting ARN to everyone. As a global uh, member from the Global International Relations Committee, that's one of the things that I'm talking always in our meetings. This is one of the things that everyone and ARN has in its mission and we should do and try to uh, connect to any ARN member or try to uh, get some help from uh, anyone that can provide us those guidelines. This is one of the, our objectives. ARN has the, the objective to provide the best evidence-based evidence practice and the best guidelines to everyone. But of course, we need to address some problems from uh, countries that are getting issues to, to get those data, and those guidelines. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think we need to look more into that to make that available for everyone. And I could see another question in the chat box that says, what system is used to ensure that your surgeons are compliant? I know compliance is another major issue. Even when you want to start the surgical safety checklist, no one is paying attention and you <laughs> actually want them to be compliant. So what would you recommend in relation to that? Thank you. So uh, I think it's it's a it's a problem uh, for everyone. I think it's a global problem. Not um, when we talk about this, we we all are always uh, talking about this uh, compliance, uh, the surgeons' compliance. Um, I think the pair of the nurses in in each OR are the main leaders. So uh, circulating nurse and also the scrub nurse, sometimes the third tech, they are the leaders of everything that is happening inside the, the, that surgery or that procedure. And of course, we have some difficulties. We need to uh, improve, we need to do it better. But um, if we see those barriers sometimes come from the lack of attention, from too much noise, uh, too much distraction, and we are the, the masters. We are doing everything to uh, get the best practice and the best safety in, in the OR, I think what that's one of the goals of one of the objectives of the perioperative nursing. So we are playing a very important role on this. Thing. Um, we need to to try to bring them along and try to help them to be more concentrated. Uh, I think it's not a problem that we can do it uh, a big change on the future. We need to continuously show that we are doing the best practice, we are improving, and then they will come along with us because they will see that we are getting better outcomes. They are there to uh, do the surgery for the patients, but they also are the ones, the, the, the main uh, responsibility gets along with the surgeons and they want better outcomes for the patients. So we need to, to bring that to the uh, discussion in that, in that situation. And probably with best practice and also reducing the barriers, reducing the, the problems, uh, lack of, uh, of concentration, uh, yeah, reducing the noise inside the ORs, um, more concentration probably will uh, achieve and will uh, continuously get more uh, compliance for the surgeons and better outcomes for, our, for, for every surgery and for our patients. I think thank you Stella so much. Also, yeah, thanks Stella for also talk, to, talk talk here about uh, Eorna and Acorn. Yes, uh, there are some um, 
um, guidelines. There are some associations in uh, uh, other uh, countries and other continents. Uh, here in Europe, you have IORNA and also um, you have ACORN and, and other associations that can provide the, the best guidelines. Uh, but still, these uh, mainly utilize the best evidence pra practices that come from ERN um, systematic reviews. So uh, we can talk to those uh, associations, but also I think we, we can discuss this uh, later and try to improve these discussions for, for, for the future to see how can we provide to each facility to which who are uh, the best guidelines because they need their the info the data should be there available and the best practice guidelines if they are available we know for sure that we are going getting best practice so i don't know if i would interrupt you sorry no, no, no. Thank you so much. Um, that was a brilliant presentation and thanks to everyone for connecting. Is there any other question? One last question or we can close for the evening. Any other question or contribution or if you have something to say or a recommendation in relation to everything that has been said? Someone from Portugal, would you like to say something? <laughs> we had loads of people from Portugal connect to the meeting, so... Um, yeah, I really want to say thank you to everyone for connecting. Thank you to our speaker for honoring our invitation. Thank you for sharing relevant knowledge. I know it's a crucial topic in the operating room environment um, that we can't actually overemphasize. Thank you so much for that, for sharing your knowledge with us and for sharing your research as well. In terms of the guidelines, I think we need to look that up and um, continue from where we stopped to make sure that we have all these guidelines available for um, especially low and middle income countries so that practices can be improved and everything could be evidence-based. So thank you. And I really want to say thank you to the Education and Training Committee of TORG for facilitating such a brilliant session, an informative session. Thank you to all the team and thank you to everyone who connected, I must say, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zones, and good night, because some people are actually almost at midnight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for connecting. The next session would be in another two weeks on St. Patrick's Day, which is going to be um, on aesthetic medicine. So um, that would be on March 17th. We're looking forward to have everyone connected again. So thank you for joining us tonight. If you've got any questions or if you would like to reach out to the speaker, um, you could leave a message, you could send a message to the team, you could reach out to TORG on the website or via our social media handle pages, or you could send any recommendation that you have. And um, thank you so much, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night, good afternoon, depending on your time zones. Thank you for connecting. Thank you.